Do you find yourself like I do, dictating into your smartphone? Yeah, I use the dictation feature of my iPhone all the time. You know, you tap that little microphone and it translates my speech to words into a text. But as accurate as the dictation is, I got to admit, I, I have never really become great friends with Siri, the built-in digital assistant. And I don't know how many people or many people have, you know, they just just a little example. Let me give you an example of how difficult this is. Our producer, Christopher, trying to talk with her, talk with Siri just a few hours ago. What time is my appointment on Sunday evening? You have four appointments last Tuesday at 12 a.m. I said, what time is my appointment on Sunday evening? You have four appointments last Tuesday at 12 a.m. I'm not asking about Tuesday. I don't know what you mean by, I'm not asking about Tuesday. How about a web search for it? And just like with Christopher, that's what happens to me usually. Siri says, I'll search for it on the web. Typical, right? So... Why not just open the calendar app and save the time if you ask somebody to look at the calendar for you? Forgo the assistance of this uh, not very helpful assistant. Well, I'm not trying to pick on Siri here because all this leads up to the question, what is about the way I talk or about human conversation that makes this such a challenge for artificial intelligence developers? I mean, the tech titans are all developing these assistants. you got Google and Apple and Facebook and Microsoft and Amazon Who's going to get? Who's going to win the prize? Who's going to come out on top? Well, that's what we're going to be uh, talking about. Carolina Milanese is an analyst at Creative uh, Strategies in San Jose, California. Welcome to Science Friday. Thank you for having me. Uh, Justine Cassell, Associate Dean of Technology Strategy and Impact for the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University in uh, Pittsburgh. Welcome to Science Friday. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, Carolina, what's what's your experience using Siri and Alexa? And so, am I, am I giving these assistants an undeserved bad rap here? Well, uh, you know, I'm Italian. I lived in the UK for 17 years. Moved to Silicon Valley for four years ago. I'm married to a New Yorker, so my accent is not something that Siri is very happy with. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's uh, you know one of the difficulties is definitely how voice. Um, accents, jargon, uh, different, you know, words that we use all the time. And, and we want to be talking to these digital assistants in the same way that you and I are talking. And a lot of times that is not possible. Now, it, it's been interesting to see the different approaches that uh, vendors have taken to this. So Alexa um, has a very detailed list of things that you can ask her, and she's very precise uh, about how you need to ask her things, and if you do it the right way, she's very helpful. Uh, but most of us don't want to learn that. We just want to talk to them. Yeah, we want to, you know, like uh, like they do on Star Trek, you, or they do in, in, in you know, <laughs> 2001 Space Odyssey. You just say a word or, you know, you ask the computer to do something, and it knows exactly what you're saying, it knows exactly what you want to do. Uh, Justine, you agree that... It's very well, difficult to t teach these computers to learn how to speak English or Spanish or Italian. <laughs> what we're talking about right now is how difficult it is to get them to understand English and English spoken by people with a variety of accents. And that's because there's an entire pipeline that goes into an assistant like this understanding what you say. It has to understand your accent mm. and translate it into text. And then it uh, has to understand the meaning of that text, and then it has to reason about what an appropriate reply is, and then it has to say that appropriate reply in a way that's understandable. And you've given examples, lots of examples, and, and I have many more, of um, what's called automatic speech recognition failures, that is not understanding what you're saying. And you also gave an example of it not understanding the meaning looking up Tuesday uh, when what you meant was Sunday. But you started out the show by saying that it was difficult to be friends with these assistants. And that's what I think is really the crux of the, of the matter, because these assistants are advertised as the future of our interaction with computing in the same way we interact with our human assistants or our human colleagues. And do you think that's the case? Most most people don't. 
I, I think you're right. I think that we want we want actually maybe not to become close friends, but friends enough that we can carry on a conversation and even have context, right? Yep. So that so that when I say um, you know I say oh can you make me a reservation at this restaurant, and and then I come back later and I say did you make the reservation. I don't hear what restaurant, what reservation. You know, it's <laughs> right. it remembers my former conversation. Right. I heard a great example from Alex, uh, Alexa, sorry, where um, someone asked Alexa to set an alarm, and when the alarm went off, the person said, thanks. But Alexa didn't turn off the alarm because she didn't know that thanks meant thanks for turning on the alarm, now turn off the alarm. Because what we mean is not always contained in what we say. Right. And our way of talking to different people changes over time. So the way I talk to you is the way I talk to somebody I just met. Nice to meet you. I'm being fairly polite. As we get to know each other, I, I may be a little less polite, but that's because I'm a New Yorker. And you're a New Yorker, too, so you're going to get <laughs> it. <laughs> All three of us are New Yorkers. Hey, we'll now, wait a minute fast. here. Forget <laughs> about it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But Siri or Cortana or M or Alexa, they all talk to us as if it's the first time they've met us. And it's no fun to have a personal assistant mm -hmm. with amnesia. That's not what we want from our assistant. We want them to say, you remember that thing you were looking at online last week? Well, the price has gone down. And we know what trouble you got in last year when you forgot your husband's uh, birthday. So I suggest you look it up today and you buy it now while the price is low. Right. That's the kind of not just context, but also the kind of pushy conversation you might expect from someone you've known for a long time. And that's actually what I've been working on is building in those social smarts as well as linguistics smarts into personal assistance, Does, virtual personal how, assistance. How, yeah, I know that's something called Sarah. Is is that the name of exactly. it? Exactly. And right. And, and how do you how does Sarah learn about what the right way to do things is? S Sarah learns for the moment. Sarah has learned from sixty hours of human human conversation over the course of five weeks. So we put groups pairs of people together, and we had them do a task together, and we videotaped them. And they did that task for an hour each week. And we looked at the differences between the pairs, but also the differences across weeks. And we found, for example, that teasing went up from week to week. And uh, referring to shared experience went up from week to week. So I might say, remember how we did that last week? Well, let's try that again this week. But positivity and praise went down from week to week. Hmm. And that's the kind of thing that we've built into Sarah, which stands for the socially aware robot assistant. And we find that people are surprisingly engaged, surprisingly because they themselves are surprised by how engaged they are and by how compelling they find the experience. Hmm. Carolina, there, there's a lot of money at stake in getting this right, isn't there? There is. Um, you know, it's called, uh, it, it, a lot of people see this as the next uh, computing platform is the invisible platform to some extent. Voice is, is very powerful. But I think there's still a lot of questions there as far, not just the, the social side as we've just been discussing, but what kind of assistance do we, do we want? I talk about it in uh, Jarvis and Mary Poppins terms. You know, from a family perspective, um, you see a lot of advertising for Alexa and Google Home of these things that come in and, and there are your Mary Poppins in the home and helping out and, and reminding everybody about things. The reality is that most of them at the moment are associated with just one account. So they know everything about one person in the family. And that's not really, um, you know, what Mary Poppins does. She needs to know everything about everybody to be able to, to help the family. And then others, like Siri, are more um, suited for a Jarvis experience. So they are my assistant, you know, with what Apple is doing with the uh, AirPods in, in uh, having Siri whispering in your ear, like, you know, you've seen the movies for the ambassador, that person behind their, their shoulders just saying, oh, this is so-and-so you met him two years ago. He has a daughter, and that's what he does, right? That 
a little bit the idea, but it's unclear how we're going to get there. And um, for now, I think advertising is way overselling what, in general, what these assistants do. Um, there's a lot of demand already, but I think, uh, you know, trying to talk about them in that context of, oh, wow, they really are helping out my life and my life is going to be so much easier now is, is overselling for now. And it would let consumers down once they try and then that frustration comes in because he doesn't understand that when you say her, you mean your daughter, your spouse, your friend, and you still need to say who you're referring to. And just every time you speak, starting with Hey Siri or Alexa or Google, that's not natural. I don't keep on saying your name every time I engage with you. Right. That's Uh, that same amnesia that makes us feel as if they've just met us for the first time. on On the other hand, Mary Poppins, to take this analogy a little further, She lived in my house. She was around (laughs) all the time. She heard my most intimate conversations. She's dealing with the kids. You, for this to become more like Mary Poppins, you have to give up your privacy, don't you? Haven't you already given up your privacy? (laughs) (laughs) Well, Mary's not moved in yet. but (laughs) (laughs) No, but a lot of other technology has. I mean, but seriously, they, they, to get some, you know, if you don't want to have to, if you don't say Alexa or Siri, that they are listening or watching all the time, right? The, even when you're not talking to them, they could be collecting your conversation with someone else. Right, right. That's the case, and and that's also the case with um, the emails you write and mm-hmm. the text messages you send. And most of the technology today is based on machine learning algorithms that require a tremendous amount of data. And to get that quantity of data, they have to be collecting a lot of what you say. And so in some sense, unless you read the small talk, you may already be giving a lot of your talk to science, so to speak, rather than giving your body to science. You're giving a lot of details about your life to machine learning. Mm-hmm. I'm Ira Plato. This is Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International. Talking with uh, Cal- Carolina Milanese and Justine uh, Cassell uh, about uh, these new digital assistants. So where do we, uh, where do we stand? Um, what should we, should we expect to be seeing new and improved stuff coming out soon? Every day. Every day. Absolutely. Yes, this really is. As Carolina said, this is expected to be the computing platform of the future. And really, all the tech giants are trying to compete in this space. They're trying to make it so that while you're driving, for example, your hands are busy, you can be talking to a personal assistant. While you're at home, you can be talking to a personal assistant that will segue into that same personal assistant on another platform in your Mm -hmm. office. Now, how long it's going to take to achieve that vision is another question. Now, let me go to the phones. Uh, our number, 844-724-8255. Katie in Kansas City, Missouri. Hi, Katie. Hi there. You know, my, my question is, um, my husband and I don't use this, but we were over at a friend's house, and we were uh, testing the Alexa app. And I think one of the things we noticed is, um, you know, we found throughout the evening we were frustrated at times. She didn't understand what we were saying. We had to keep repeating ourselves. And what was really fascinating was two things. It's one, we have friends named Alexa, and so we're curious kind of the fact that there's this new service you're working on called Sarah. Um, what is kind of the feedback around using names that are still common in our society today? And my second question is the fact that these are overwhelmingly female voices and female names, mm. do you think that's creating a new dynamic or bringing back kind of a, the old school feeling of our assistants tend to be female? Why aren't there more apps with male voices, I guess, is my question. Excellent question. And actually, in an article in the Times earlier this week, I talked about whether we push the boundaries of gender stereotypes or whether we stay within those boundaries. And Sarah, we only called it Sarah, and we only made it female because we worked very hard to find an acronym and socially aware robot assistant was the only one we could come up with. If it had been a male name, it would have been a uh, male-looking agent with a male male body. But Bob, um, big old something Bob could have been. I know. I tried really hard. I couldn't couldn't find anything. 
Um, but it it is the case that we have uh, that different cultures have different um, stereotypes, and so Siri in the UK is a male voice. Hmm. Can you make Alexa be a, a male voice if you want? I think you can. Does that answer your question? Thanks. Thanks for going, Carolina. How how do you react to that? Well, it's interesting that to start with the you know we think does the assistant need to be personified or not, and I argue that um, you are creating more of a relationship if it is. And uh, you know if I think about when we got uh, Echo, and you can actually call uh, Echo Echo. You don't have to call um, Echo Alexa if you don't want to, but. Alexa, you are personifying this, this kind of jar-looking thing that you have on your shelf. And when we were setting it up, my eight-year-old asked me, well, what are you doing? I said, well, this is Echo, there's Alexa. And she goes, well, is she like Siri? And she used she. Hmm. So it was, is mm -hmm. she like Siri? And I said, um, yeah. And then she asked the question, and she got her answer, and she said, well, she's smarter than Siri. Can we keep her? <laughs> and there was immediately, you know, five minutes in, there was that emotional connection that she created with this thing. And I think that's important for consumers to learn to trust the assistant and then engage in that conversation. Now, the female and male, you know, is, is a whole different conversation. We were watching a program mm -hmm. the other day on AI in general, and there was uh, uh, Watson from IBM. And again, my eight-year-old is a blessing as far as tweets and everything else that I can use. Um, said, "Well, is uh, is it like Alexa, but is a boy?" Yeah. Well, I've got. So it, we, we'll, I have to. I have to wrap up because we've run out of time. Maybe we'll call a Hal. How about that? Or we don't want to call it Hal. Uh, Allison Van and. Uh, <coughs> uh, I want to thank you, Carolyn Millinazi creative, uh, from Creative Strategies in San Jose, and Justine Cassell, an Associate Dean of Technology Strategy and Impact for the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh.